in John chapter 7, and uh, the name of this sermon is John 7, the division caused by Jesus Christ. John 7, the division caused by Jesus Christ. That's one thing you'll notice in this chapter that people are very divided about Jesus Christ. In this chapter, some people want to kill Jesus. Some people believe on him. Some people say he's a deceiver. Some people say, say he's telling the truth. And the truth was that Jesus Christ, when he was here, he caused a huge division. Some people believed him. They received him. They believed everything he said. And then, of course, they wanted to kill him, a lot of people. So we see the division caused by Jesus Christ. Now, let's look at the first point here. The first point is this, that the unsaved world does not understand our purpose and goals. Look at what it says in John 7, verse 1. After these things, Jesus walked in Galilee, for he would not walk in Jewry because the Jews sought to kill him. So in John 7, verse 1, the Bible tells us the Jews sought to kill Jesus. Yep. The Jews wanted to kill Jesus. That's what it says. Now, Jesus was aware of this. He was a smart guy. He realized the fact that his preaching had caused people to dislike him, caused people to hate him. His first sermon, what did they try to do to him? They tried to throw him off a cliff. Okay? His preaching divided people. And here it says in verse 1, the Jews sought to kill him. He is aware of this. But, you know, the average person probably wasn't aware of it. They don't understand the persecution that a believer goes through if they preach boldly what the truth is in the Bible. But you notice throughout the entire Bible, not just Jesus Christ, but in the Old Testament, all the prophets and people that preached on behalf of God, the world hated them. They didn't receive them. And that's what we see in John chapter 7, verse 1. So notice what it says in verse 2. Now the Jews' feast of tabernacles was at hand. His brethren therefore said unto him, Depart hence and go into Judea, that the disciples also may see the works that thou doest. For there is no man that doeth anything in secret, and he himself seeketh to be known openly. If thou do these things, show thyself to the world, for neither did his brethren believe in him. So what you're seeing in verses 2 through 5 is the brothers of Jesus Christ are mocking him. They're making fun of him. They say, go show yourself to the world. If you're really the Savior, if everything you say is true, go show yourself to the world. Now, there's an obvious reason why he's not showing himself to the world, though. He realized they're trying to kill him. Okay? See, his brothers, obviously they're envious of Jesus Christ. Obviously they're mad at their brother, and they don't believe on him at this moment. They end up believing on him after he, once you rise again from the dead, it's kind of like, okay, <laughs> I, I guess my brother was the Savior. But before that, they did not believe on him. Right. And so they want him to go to Judea. But, you know, if he goes to Judea, it's a suicide mission. Why? Because the Jews are trying to kill him. That's what it says in the first verse. And so Jesus is aware of that, but his brothers aren't aware of that. See, they don't understand our purpose. They don't understand the conflict we go through. They don't understand our goals in life. And what they're basically accusing him of is being an arrogant person. They are saying that he wants to be known by the world, that Jesus wants to be famous. Look, when Jesus came here, he came and humbled himself, right. became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. It's the exact opposite. When Jesus was here, he didn't come to be a conquering hero. He will come to be a conquering hero one day. Yeah. You see how wicked the world is? It, it could be sooner than we realize. It could be in our lifetime. But you know, when Jesus came the first time, he didn't come to be a conquering hero. If he did, he would have conquered everything. No, he came to die for the sins of the world. And so he's not coming to be known by everybody. And he realizes it's not his time yet. We're in John 7. There's 21 chapters in John. He doesn't get killed until the end of the book. If he just decided to make himself known and just, you know, preach in a certain way, he would have been killed. But that's not what he did when he preached. He was wise about how he preached, and he realized it wasn't his time. Notice verse 6. Then Jesus said unto them, My time has not yet come. But your time is always ready. The world cannot hate you, but me it hated because I testify of it that the works thereof are evil. People get this idea that Jesus Christ was loved by everybody when he was here. Mm -hmm. Not according to this verse. He said the world hates me. Me it hated. That's what Jesus said. Now, yes, you see tons of people listening to him. There's a great multitude where he feeds them with fish and, and loaves of bread. Yes, a lot of people listen to him from time to time, but there's also people that killed him one day. Yep. There's also people that tried to kill him over and over again, and the world by and large rejected Jesus Christ. Look at the world we have today. Do most people believe on Jesus Christ? No. Nope. No. Narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. 
most people are going to go to hell. So guess what? When he was actually alive, most people also rejected him. If he was around today, most people would reject him. Most people don't think they would reject him, but the truth is people don't like the words of the Bible by and large. Now go to John 3, because what Jesus said, turn to John 3, was they hate it because he testifies of it that the works thereof are evil. And in John 3, notice verses 19 and 20. And this is the condemnation that light has come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. For everyone that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. So what the Bible says is that the people that hate the light, they don't want to be near the light. People that are living an ungodly life and have wicked deeds, they don't want to be near the light. They don't want to be in a church like this that's actually going to preach what the Bible says. Right. Why? Because it shines the light on their sins. Yep. See, that's the reason why the world hated Jesus, because he shined the light on their sins. Mm -hmm. Look, if somebody is a drug addict, they don't want somebody preaching against being a drug addict. They'll be offended by it. And most people would rather just not go to church. They don't want the light to be shown on their sin. They don't want to read the Bible. They don't want the words of God. And so Jesus Christ, when he was here, look, he preached against the world. He preached against their wickedness. So guess what? They didn't like him. Turn back to John chapter 7. John 7. Now, obviously, there's exceptions to this. I mean, in this room, it's filled full of people that love the Lord. But you have to realize that most people don't love the Lord. Most people don't want to hear the words of God. And, you know, you, you realize that even though there's a lot of people that go to church in this country, the truth is that a lot of people that go to church, they don't live very godly lives, though. Yeah. I mean, our, our country is going downhill very fast. Now, it's like that throughout the entire world. But, I mean, in our country, you know, the, the sin level has just increased dramatically. You know, it didn't used to be that tons of people had kids out of wedlock. That's becoming pretty common in the Philippines. It wasn't common 30, 40 years ago. But yeah, the world is becoming more and more wicked, and when the world becomes wicked, guess what? They're going to be mad at the people preaching against the wickedness. Yeah. Why? Because they're not living very godly lives. Now it says in John 7, verse 8, Go ye up unto this feast. I go not up yet unto this feast, for my time is not yet full come. When he had said these words unto them, he abode still in Galilee. But when his brethren were gone up, then went he also up unto the feast. Not openly, but as it were in secret. So Jesus tells his brothers to go to the feast. And he does go to the feast, but he does it secretly. Why is he doing it secretly? Because he knows the Jews want to kill him. Mm -hmm. That's what it said at the beginning of the chapter. Now, obviously, his brothers don't understand that. They don't believe that, but Jesus is aware of that. So one thing we need to understand here is this, that it's, it's not weak to decide to be smart about how you fight battles. See, I mean, Jesus went secretly. Right? You know, there are truly wicked people that would want to destroy you. People that are powerful people. You look at politicians, whether it's this country or any country, and other people that are high level people. Look, you got to be kind of careful with how you deal with them. And Jesus Christ, when he was here, guess what? He went up secretly to the feast. Why? Because he realized people wanted to kill him. So he was smart about what he did. Now, notice what it says in verse 11. Then the Jews sought him at the feast and said, Where is he? And there was much murmuring among the people concerning him. For some said he is a good man. Others said nay, but he deceiveth the people. Notice the division caused by Jesus Christ. Some say he's a good man. Others say he's a deceiver. There's really no in-between position. When you think about who Jesus Christ was, he claimed to be God in the flesh. He claimed to be the Savior. He claimed to be perfect. He claimed that he was going to rise again from the dead. Now, you either believe that, or you're saying he's the biggest deceiver who's ever lived. There's no in-between position. Yeah. You know, when I was in Guyana mission, on a missions trip, I use this example because there's a famous cultist there, Jim Jones, who claimed to be the Savior, who claimed to be the Second Coming. And I, I asked people this question because there's a lot of Hindus there, people from different religions, a lot of Muslims. And I said, you know, well, Jesus claimed to be, you know, God in the flesh. He said he was the only way to heaven. And he said he was going to rise again from the dead. I said, let's say I told you those things. Let's say I told you that I'm going to rise again from the dead. I'm the only way to heaven. And, you know, I'm the savior of the world. Now, there's three possibilities. Either I'm telling the truth, I'm lying about it, or I'm crazy. <laughs> it's one of those things, right? And see, Jesus claimed that he was the savior, the Christ, that he was going to rise again from the dead. So what if someone says, I don't believe that he rose again from the dead? 
The only logical explanation of what they should be thinking is he's a terrible person. Yep. If he wasn't the real deal, he's a terrible person. And yet Muslims will say, well, I think he was a great prophet. No, he claimed to be God in the flesh. Yep. Look, everybody's a liar, but look, I've never told people I'm God in the flesh. That's a pretty big lie to make. If Jesus wasn't actually God in the flesh, he's the worst person and the biggest deceiver who's ever lived. There's no in-between position to take. The Hindus say, well, he was a great man of God. No, he was either God in the flesh and the Savior and the Christ and the only way to heaven, like he said, or he was a terrible human being. The Buddha say he was such a great teacher. No, he was either the real deal or he was a phony. Yeah. See, honestly, the only religion in the world, the only religion in the world that says that Jesus Christ was an, an evil person are the Jews. That is what they teach. You can read their writings on the Talmud, and they say that he was basically possessed by devils, and he was doing things by, un, by evil spirits. They say that, you know, basically Mary cheated on her husband, and that's where, that he's the son of Pantera. That's what the Jews actually teach. Now, they don't say that, you know, openly where people know that, but that's what they believe, that Jesus was the son of Pantera, not of Mary and Joseph. Okay? Now, obviously, we know he was born of the Virgin Mary. But, you know, the Jews don't believe that. But they say that Mary cheated on her husband Joseph with a guy by the name of Pantera. That's where Jesus came from. They actually do teach that Jesus was an evil person. But at least what they say makes sense. Okay? It makes sense that if he's not the real deal, he is an evil person. There's no in-between position here. He either is the real deal or he's not. And so it kind of makes sense that either he's a good man or he's a deceiver. And look, the Jews here, they believe he's a deceiver. That's the chapter where we see. You know, the Jews want to kill him. They teach the same thing today. Verse 13. How be it, no man spake openly of him for fear of the Jews. People are afraid of the Jews. That's what it says in verse 13. They realize the Jews are pretty powerful people. In a lot of countries, including in this country, religious leaders are very powerful. That's what we're seeing here in John chapter 7. The Pharisees were very powerful. They were powerful people, and so people are afraid to speak openly. It makes sense. I mean, if you speak openly, you can go to Orthodox countries. And if you speak against the Orthodox Church, you're probably going to be thrown in prison. You go to a Muslim country, and you say something against the Muslims, what's going to happen? You can have your head chopped off. Yep. You go to countries where the religious leaders are powerful, and if you say anything against them, you could have some major persecution. Mm -hmm. Now, in this country, there's really not much persecution. We're able to freely preach the gospel and talk to people about the Bible, invite people to church. We're freely allowed to have a Bible, which in some countries they're not. But in some countries, there's actually real persecution. We're afraid to have any opinions, and that's what we see here in John chapter 7. Now, let's look at John chapter 7, verse 14. And I want us to understand also here tonight the Jews' misunderstanding of the Old Testament. That's point number two, the Jews' misunderstanding of the Old Testament. Notice verse 14. Now about the midst of the feast, Jesus went up into the temple and taught. And the Jews marveled, saying, How knoweth this man letters, having never learned? Now that's a very interesting statement where Jesus is obviously preaching and teaching, and it's obvious he knows what he's talking about. It's obvious he's very educated. And the Jews say, wait a minute, this guy's never learned before. Now why would they say a statement like that? Basically what they're saying is, he didn't learn from our institutions and our schools. Mm -hmm. Basically, you can't get knowledge outside of our Pharisee system where we teach you what it says. You know, we have the same thing today where people think that you cannot know the Bible unless you go to Bible college. Right. Isn't that what they teach? Yeah. That if you don't go to Bible college, there's no way you can have any knowledge. Well, wait a minute. If you're saved, you're involved with the Spirit of God, which is mm -hmm. the Spirit of truth. And so when you read this Bible as a believer, you can understand it. Yeah. Now, yes, you know, we have preachers and teachers to help us with things, but anybody in this room can open this book in their free time and understand it and understand the great mysteries that God has for us. You don't need somebody to teach you. Why? Because you have the Holy Spirit teaching you. Right. And as a saved person, you can have the Word of God and you can learn. But see, the Pharisees had this attitude that how could somebody possibly learn unless we talk? What a stupid attitude they have. Right. Because, I mean, the Word of God is the Word of God. You can learn the Word of God on your own. Now, yes, it helps to have people teach you, but this attitude that you have to go to Bible college, people have the same attitude today. They'll look down on someone unless they graduated from Bible college. Look, I didn't graduate from Bible college. 
You know what I did? I actually read this book, and I went to a local church that trained me and allowed me to preach there, and then they ordained me and sent me out to start a church. Man. That's what I did. And that's the method you see in the Bible, because guess what? Show me the Bible college in this book. Show me where there's a Bible college. You're not going to find it. There is no Bible college. You know what people did? They went to a local church, and that's how they got trained. That's what you see in the Bible. Now, obviously, Jesus was specifically preaching and teaching people. You see Paul the Apostle take people under his wing, and he's teaching them the Word of God and training them. And look, the greatest experience you get is actually being involved in a church, running ministries. You know, when I was at Verity Baptist Church, there was a lot of ministries that I was given the ability to, to, to run, obviously under the authority of Pastor Jimenez. But he gave me the opportunity to kind of lead those ministries. And look, you learn from mistakes. You learn from trial and error. You don't learn by sitting up in a seminary and just, you know, writing whatever all day. Right. Look, people graduate from college. I graduated with a math degree. And then you start your first day on the job, and it's like, okay, well, how do I use this? Because you know how to get an A on a test. It doesn't mean, though, that you can actually do the job. Right. You have to actually be trained. And if you want to run a church one day, what better way than to be at a church and get opportunities to run ministries, and then you get trained, and then you start your own church. Right. And see, this attitude that you have to go to Bible college, look, that's just not in the Bible. Bible college is never mentioned in the Bible. In fact, the only mention of college in the Bible is not a good thing. It's actually a bad thing. Notice what it says in verse 16. Jesus answered them and said, My doctrine is not mine, but his that sent me. If any man will do his will, he shall know of the doctrine, whether it be of God or whether I speak of myself. So what Jesus said in verse 17 is, if any man will do his will. Okay. So what does it mean to do the will of God? We'll turn to John 6. John 6. Now obviously when we talk about the will of God... There's obviously a lot of things that are under the will of God that he wants for our lives. But I'll tell you what the number one first thing he wants for you in your life. It's found in John 6 verse 40. And this is the will of him that sent me. So this is how you study the Bible. You compare spiritual things with spiritual as the Bible says. He talks about doing the will. And so you go to another place where it talks about what the will is. This is the will of him that sent me. That everyone which seeth the Son and believeth on him may have everlasting life. And I will raise him up the last day. What is the first part of the will of God for your life? It's to believe on Jesus Christ and become a child of God. Now, doesn't that make perfect sense? Because if somebody learns every single thing in the world, but they never believe on Jesus, where are they going to spend eternity? They're going to spend it in hell forever. The number one thing in our lives is that we believe on Jesus Christ. This is the will of him that sent me, that everyone would see at the Son and believeth on him. May have everlasting life. That's why our church believes in so many. We go out there, we knock the doors, we talk to people, we preach the gospel. Why? We want them to get started on the will of God. And it starts with believing on Jesus Christ. That's the first thing mentioned is that you believe on Jesus Christ and you get saved. That's the number one thing. Now turn back to John 7. And the truth is that if you never believe on Jesus Christ, you're never going to understand anything in this book. You say, why? Well, this was not written by man. Yep. This was written by God. Now, yes, he used men to write his words. Mm-hmm. But look, let me give you an example of this. You know, my, my dad and I have written a couple children's short stories. And the way we've done it is this, that, you know, my, my dad has a really creative mind. But I'm better at actually doing the writing in terms of getting things to rhyme and things like that. So basically, he gives me, the, he gave, he's given me the outline of what he wants written. And I wrote it, write it in a poetic form. Now, those, that didn't really come from my mind. That came from his mind. So you look at who really wrote that story. Well, I mean, I'm the one who put it into poetic form, but they actually came from my dad. It's his creative mind. It's his story. I'm just helping him write it down. Okay? Now, when it comes to the Word of God, God's the one who had made all the words here. All it is is one man just writing it down. Yeah. Okay? And so, yes, several men were used to write the Bible. It wasn't their words, though. They were the words of God. And so it's a spiritual book. Okay? It's a spiritual book, so guess what? You need the Spirit of God inside of you to understand it. And so someone who's never believed on Jesus Christ and does not have the Holy Spirit of God indwelling them, how are they going to understand a spiritual book? They're not going to understand it. And that's why it says, if any man will do his will, he shall know of the doctrine, whether it be of God. See, if you've believed on Jesus Christ, 
You have the spirit of God, the spirit of truth. So when you hear something preached, you're going to know whether or not it's of God or whether it's not of God. So when there's some man in Davao who says, you know what, I'm the appointed son of God on earth, you're going to know, I don't think that's right. It doesn't sound right to me because last I checked, only Jesus Christ was the son of God. Amen. When you hear things preached, you're going to know, wait a minute, that just doesn't sound right. right. That contradicts. Somebody gets up here and says, well, you got to get baptized to be saved. No, wait a minute. John 3.16 says, whosoever believe. You're going to know that's false. So when you hear somebody preaching, you can determine if it's true or not. Why? Because you're saved, because you have the Spirit of God inside of you. But if right. someone does not have the Spirit of God inside of them, they're not going to understand the Word of God. Right. And that's why people join bizarre cults that are out there. Why? They're very zealous people. They want to do what's right, but unfortunately, they just don't know what the truth is. And so they join crazy religions that, are, that don't make any sense whatsoever. What does it say in John 7, verse 18? He that speaketh of himself seeketh his own glory. But he that seeketh his glory that sent him, the same is true, and no unrighteousness is in him. And this was basically what his brothers were accusing him of earlier in the chapter. They're basically saying that he was seeking his own glory. Hey, go show yourself to the world since you're seeking your own glory. But you know what Jesus says is that he that seeketh his glory that sent him, the same is true. So he didn't seek glory in this world. Jesus came not to be a conquering hero, but to humble himself and become obedient unto death and the death of the cross. And turn to John 8. John 8. And in John 8, verse 47, is a very interesting verse where it says, He that is of God heareth God's words. Ye therefore hear them not, because ye are not of God. Now, Everyone always likes to say that Jesus Christ was just always so nice. He never said anything mean. Well, he just told them, you know what? You're not of God. That's why you don't understand what's being said. <laughs> and in John 8, we're going to look at that next week. He says, you're of your father, the devil. That's even more mean. There's a reason why people wanted to kill him, because he wasn't always the nicest person. He would just preach what the truth is. You know, that's what you see throughout the Bible. That's what God's people are supposed to do. But what it said was, he that is of God heareth God's words. What does that mean? It basically means that as a saved person, you're going to be able to understand whether what you hear is true or not. Now, obviously when it comes to the Bible, there are things that people could have different interpretations of. Look, the Bible is infinitely deep. There's not a single person in the world who fully understands the Bible and has every interpretation correct. Mm -hmm. But, you know, most things in the Bible are not complicated. You say, Brother Stuck, you know, I don't know whether or not God wants me to commit adultery on my wife. Look, that's not a complicated topic in the Bible. God makes it pretty clear. Yeah, you know what? That's a wicked sin to commit. You know, I don't know whether God wants me to get drunk. Uh, I can, I'm pretty sure I can show you a lot of verses that say, don't drink. <laughs> Most things in the Bible aren't complicated. So, yes, there are certain topics where there's verses that we can have a different interpretation on. And, you know, who knows who's right? But, you know, when it comes to most of the Bible, it's pretty black and white. God doesn't make it complicated to figure out what's true and what's not true. And, you know, when you, when you see somebody who hears what the Bible says over and over again and they don't understand it or they don't believe it, that shows that's someone who's not of God. They don't have the Spirit of God helping them interpret. Because when you read a verse like John, or not John 1, but Genesis 1, 1, in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth, it's not very complicated. Yep. Guess what created the heaven and the earth? God did. Mm -hmm. And then people say, well, wait a minute, I think the earth's billions of years old. It's like, I mean, are you reading the same book I am? Because... The Bible says in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, and he lays it out in six days, and you add up the years of the people after that, from Adam all the way up to the modern day, the earth is barely over 6,000 years old. Yeah. And if you take the Bible literally, there's no other way to interpret it, mm -hmm. because in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. It's not complicated when you have the Spirit of God inside of you, but if somebody's not saved, it's going to be pretty complicated for them. Mm -hmm. And they look at something very clear, like in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, and they say, well, I don't know. Maybe it took, maybe it was six days, like I said, but maybe it was 6,000 years, maybe it's 6 billion years, who knows? <laughs> or like the Hindus say, maybe, maybe the earth was created on the back of a giant turtle. It's like, yeah, you know, who knows what's true? Just believe whatever you want then, I guess. It's not complicated when you're saved. Yeah. But when someone's not saved, they can come up to any, any number of interpretations of verses. Turn back to John 7. Obviously, when we talk about the minor prophets or even the major prophets, you know, you go to the book of Ezekiel, go to the book of Zechariah. Look, there's there's some complicated things. In there. 
Mm -hmm. Because they're prophesying about the end times, there's a lot of symbolism. Yeah, you know, there's a lot of complicated things there. But when it comes to most of the Bible and how we live our lives, it's not complicated. You say, Brother Stucky, you know, should a person spank their child or not? There's good arguments on both sides. There's not good arguments on both sides. Because the Bible says he that spared his rod hated his child. Yeah. The Bible tells you to spank your child. See, God doesn't make it complicated whether or not you're supposed to do it or not. Usually it's just black and white. Mm -hmm. The reason why people get upset, though, is because of the fact they see things in the Bible where God says this is the way it is and people don't like what God says. That's why they wanted to kill Jesus. Why? He's preaching against what they were doing. That is why they didn't like it. Now, in verse 19, I want you to notice this. Did not Moses give you the law? And yet none of you keepeth the law. Why go ye about to kill me? So once again, he says, you're trying to kill me. Now, obviously, Jesus is telling the truth. He's not lying. They want to kill him. And he calls them out on it in front of everybody. But he said, did not Moses give you the law? And yet none of you keepeth the law. What does he say? Not a single person keeps the law. See, the Jews, as well as the Muslims, and as well as most everybody in the world, is trying to work their way to heaven, aren't they? They think if they keep the law, they're going to get to heaven. And it's like, you know, I agree with you. Go ahead and keep the law then. I mean, have you ever lied before? Well, yeah, but we haven't kept the law. <laughs> I mean, yeah, go ahead. Try to keep the law. Go ahead. Try to live a perfect life. See, my Bible says there is none righteous, no, not one. Yep. The only one that's righteous is Jesus Christ the righteous, the Bible says. Why? Because he was God in the flesh. But, you know, nobody's going to be able to keep the law. And, you know, it, it, it's just so bizarre when you think about it, how people honestly think that their good deeds are going to get them to heaven. Now, look, I was once 18 years old as an unsaved person, and I thought my good deeds were going to get me to heaven. I thought if I live a good life and obey God's law, I'll get to heaven. And then somebody showed me what the Bible says, and I'm like, wow, that's not what the Bible says at all. Now, once you're on the other side of salvation, it's really bizarre to think about how could someone not understand this? Why don't they understand? They don't have the Spirit of God inside of them. Right. That's the reason why. There's a reason why you have millions of people that worship the Feast of the Black Nazarene every year. They just don't understand that that hocus pocus healing is not of the Bible. Yeah. Why? They're not saved. They just don't understand what the Word of God says. That's the reason why. And so nobody keeps the law. Nobody even comes close to keeping the law. See, I mean, it says all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone. It only takes one lie to be a liar. Yep. Because if somebody murdered one person, you'd call them a murderer. Somebody steals one time, you call them a thief. Somebody lies one time, they're a liar. So for just one lie, we're condemned to hell forever. Mm -hmm. Now look, we've all done worse than just tell one lie in our lives. Yeah. No one's even close to keeping the law. And yet the vast majority of the world thinks that if they keep the law, they're going to get to heaven. And yet, what does Jesus say? He's like, none of you keep the law. And look, the law is not just the Ten Commandments. Nobody's kept all the Ten Commandments, but there's a lot more than Ten Commandments in this book. Mm -hmm. right. I mean, so none of us are even close to keeping the law. I mean, can you honestly sit here and tell me that you wake up every morning, just spend an hour in prayer, or just you read the Bible for an hour. Boy, you're just always happy. You never get upset. You know, everything's perfect. I mean, yeah, right. Nobody's kept the law. And anyone who would say that they've kept the law and they've lived such a great life, they deserve to go to heaven. It's a really prideful statement to make. And that's why the first step to getting saved is to humble yourself and admit, I can't earn my way to heaven. And so in verse number 20, the people answered and said, Thou hast a devil who goeth about to kill thee. And so they tell Jesus that he has a devil. They're saying, nobody's going about to kill you. What they're doing there is they're lying. Because mm -hmm. he's called them out. Jesus knows that they want to kill him. And they say, you know, nobody's going around about to kill you. Well, obviously they were, because Jesus said people want to kill him. And the beginning of this chapter said that. He realized what was actually inside their hearts and inside their minds, and they're saying, well, you have a devil. Why? They're trying to distract from the issue. They got called out on the fact that they're guilty, and they do want to kill Jesus. Mm -hmm. And so they just say, well, that's the devil. In verse 21, Jesus answered and said to them, I have done one work in you, ye all marvel. Moses therefore gave on you circumcision, not because it is of Moses, but of the fathers. And ye on the Sabbath day circumcise a man. If a man on the Sabbath day receives circumcision that the law of Moses should not be broken, are ye angry at me because I have made a man every whit whole on the Sabbath day? Judge not according to the appearance, but judge righteous judgment. And so they were mad at Jesus for healing on the Sabbath day. What a stupid thing to get mad at Moses. You know, you're upset that somebody got healed. I mean, does that make any sense? Let's say somebody had cancer, and then all of a sudden they're miraculously healed. 
Mm -hmm. I mean, how dare you get healed on the Sabbath day? <laughs> I mean, no, man was not created for the Sabbath. I mean, the Bible says that it was made for us. It's for our yeah. benefit. It gives us a day of rest. It's not something to put us into bondage. Okay? Mm -hmm. They don't understand. They, they understood to some degree because of the fact they talk about how circumcision happens on the Sabbath. But they, for healing, apparently you don't get healed on the Sabbath. You can get circumcised on the Sabbath according to them, but not get healed on the Sabbath. Obviously, they just did not understand. And what he's doing is showing that they're hypocrites because they're claiming to keep the law as being so perfect. And he's showing them, you're a complete hypocrite in what you're saying. Verse 25, then said some of them of Jerusalem, is not this he whom they seek to kill? But lo, he speaketh boldly, and they say nothing on you. Do the rulers know indeed that this is the very Christ? Howbeit we know this man whence he is, but when Christ cometh, no man knoweth whence he is. Then cried Jesus in the temple as he taught, saying, Ye both know me, and ye know whence I am, and I am not come of myself, but he that sent me is true, whom ye know not. But I know him, for I am from him, and he hath sent me. Then they sought to take him, but no man laid hands on him, because his hour was not yet come. And so basically, they're trying to take him to kill him. They're trying to take him to destroy him. His hour's not come yet. It's not time for him to die. You know, the Bible says, precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. Now, obviously, we know Jesus Christ was God in the flesh, the Savior, the Christ. But at the same time in our lives, if God still wants us here on earth, it doesn't matter if they're pointing a machine gun at your head and firing. You're not going to die if God says you're not going to die. Amen. Right? If God wants you to live and he's got a purpose for you, look, what about when they were thrown in the fiery furnace? Did they die? No. Why? God didn't want them to die. That's the reality. See, God can protect us. And look, obviously this is talking about Jesus Christ's hour was not yet come. But in terms of our lives, that's why we always talk about that the biggest safety and protection we can have is living godly. Because if you're living godly, God can protect you from anything. And look, when it comes to living for the Lord, most people aren't doing it. So if you're someone who lives for the Lord, God would have a reason and a purpose for you to be continuing. And if he allowed you to die... Your death is precious in his sight. He allowed it for a greater purpose. I had a great friend of mine in college who died, and he was not living an ungodly life. In fact, you know, he went soul winning all the time, read the Bible, he never drank, he never partied, and he died when he was 20 years old. Why did God allow him to die? You know, I don't necessarily know that, but obviously he wasn't under God's judgment. So if God would allow him to allow you to pass away, he has a greater purpose for you. Obviously, we put that in God's hands. Obviously, we don't fully know his will at all. All situations. Now, let's look at verse number 31. And it says in verse 31, this goes to our last point about Jesus, or about this chapter, that many people believed on him. Verse 31, and many of the people believed on him and said, When Christ cometh, will he do more miracles than these which this man hath done? Now, this is a very confusing verse if you just take this verse by itself. Because the first half of this verse says, Many of the people believed on him. Okay? What do you have to do to be saved? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. Mm -hmm. Whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. But then what do they say? When Christ cometh, will he do more miracles than these which this man hath done? Because in the second half of the verse, it sounds like he's saying, this is not the Christ. Will Christ end up doing more miracles than this man? It sounds like a contradiction. There are no contradictions in the Bible. There's never a contradiction. If there's something that seems like a contradiction... It's because we don't understand what's being said. Yeah. So the way we understand this verse is actually just look at the next verse, and it explains it. The next verse says this, The Pharisees heard that the people murmured such things concerning him, and the Pharisees and the chief priests sent officers to take him. So in verse 32, the Pharisees are upset about what was said by these people. Now, if these people didn't believe this was a Christ, they wouldn't be upset. They're upset by what's being said. So what is going on in verse number 31? These people believe on Jesus Christ. Doesn't it say that? They believe on him. Plain as day, many people believed on him. So what they're saying when it says, when Christ cometh, they're actually mocking the Pharisees. What they're saying is this, when Christ cometh, will he do more miracles than this man doeth? Basically what they're saying is, this guy has done so many miracles, you're saying there's going to be another Christ that's going to do more miracles than this guy? That's what they're saying. They're mocking the Pharisees. That's why the Pharisees are upset. Okay? So that's it's not a contradiction. They believe on him, as it says very clearly. We have to understand the tone of what's being said is, when Christ cometh, will we do more miracles? They're basically saying, how are you not believing on this guy? 
How do you not believe this? He's healed people. He's done all these miracles and you don't believe this? Is someone going to come and do more miracles than this guy? That's basically what they're saying. They're basically mocking the Pharisees. They're speaking sarcastically in verse number 31. And the Pharisees heard that the people murmured such things concerning him, and they sent officers to take him. They're upset with what's being said. Then, verse 33, then said Jesus unto them, yet a little while am I with you, and then I go unto him that sent me. Ye shall seek me and shall not find me, and where I am, thither ye cannot come. Then said the Jews among themselves, Whither will he go that we shall not find him? Will he go into the dispersed among the Gentiles and teach the Gentiles? What manner of saying is this that he said, Ye shall seek me and shall not find me, and where I am, thither ye cannot come. And so they're basically trying to mock Jesus and what's being said, and they're really just making themselves look foolish because throughout this whole conversation, they, they can't answer anything Jesus Christ says. They obviously don't understand the law. They don't understand the word of God, and they're trying to make him look foolish. And whenever somebody is a fool that tries to make other people look foolish, they just make themselves look foolish. And that's the way it works. We see that happen all the time. You know, people try to mock the things of God. They try to mock the Bible. People mock what we believe about creation. They say, how can you believe that God just created this? So it's like, oh, so a, a, a random explosion happened. <laughs> and then billions of years later, you know, we had this, just this bacteria in the ocean. It just came alive. And then all of a sudden, you know, animals started to get created. And billions of years later, here we are. It's like, yeah, that, that's real smart. That's so much smarter than just believing God created. I, I guess a rock created us. In the beginning, God. In the beginning, a rock. Yeah, that makes We're in the beginning, a dot that exploded, if you believe in the Big Bang Theory. Yeah, that really makes us look foolish. But when people try to make you look foolish that are fools, they just make themselves look foolish. That's the way it works. Verse 37. In the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, if any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me, as the scripture hath said, out of his belly shall flow rivet, rivers of living water. But this spake he of the Spirit, which they that believe on him should receive. For the Holy Ghost was not yet given, because that Jesus was not yet glorified. And so, in verse 39, he talks about the Spirit of God. This is referring to the Holy Spirit. When we get saved, we get indwelled with the Holy Spirit. But in John chapter 7, a saved person did not get into the Holy Ghost. Why? Jesus was not yet glorified. Okay? But that does not change the fact that before John 7, the promise in John 3, in John 3.16, is everlasting life. Mm -hmm. So even though they weren't indwelled with the Holy Ghost, they were saved forever. Right. Because it says, I give unto them eternal life and they shall never perish. Look, they don't get indwelled the, with the Holy Ghost until after Jesus rose again. But all the great verses that show everlasting life, eternal life, those are before Jesus even died. Yep. John 3.36, he that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. John 3.16, whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. John 5.24, verily, verily, I say unto you, he that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation but is passed. Present tense, but is passed from death unto life. When you believe on Jesus Christ, you have already passed from death unto life. Amen. You will not ever die. Your body will die, but who you actually are is not really your body. That's just really your outward shell. Yeah. Who you are is not found in your body. And when you physically pass away, you will go straight to heaven. Why? Because he promised, I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish. And all the examples he gives. He talks in John 3 about being born into God's family. Look, my son will always be my son. Nothing is ever going to change that. It doesn't matter if he turns 20 and says, you know what? I hate you, Dad. I never want to talk to you ever again. And he never calls me the rest of his life. It doesn't change the fact I'm his father. Amen. Nothing's ever going to change that. And look, when we get saved, you see people in the Bible that do some pretty bad things after they get saved. They rebel against God. They get mad at God. I mean, Jonah literally runs away from God, and God has to get him swallowed by a whale to get back <laughs> into his boat. Yep. People commit murder that were saved. David committed adultery with Bathsheba. But if you look very clearly in the Bible, he did not lose his salvation. Because in Psalms 51, what he lost was his joy. He didn't lose his salvation. He says, restore to me the joy of thy salvation. Because as a saved person living in sin, you will not be happy. When you know what the truth is and you rebel against it, you're not going to be happy. 
But look, as a saved person, you cannot lose your salvation. So yes, you know what? In John 7, verse 39, they were not indwelled with the Holy Ghost yet. But it doesn't change the fact that they still had the promise of eternal life. Okay, But Jesus had to be glorified before they'd be indwelled with the Holy Ghost. Now, in the Old Testament, though, you'd oftentimes see that people would get filled with the, the Spirit. Okay? And that's something that was around in the Old Testament and something that's around today. The difference between us in the Old Testament and us today is this. We are dwelt with the Holy Ghost when we believe on Jesus Christ. But the Bible still says that you can be filled with the Spirit, which can give you boldness to preach the gospel or to do something mighty for God. But everybody that's saved is dwelt with the Holy Ghost in today's world. Verse 40. Many of the people, therefore, when they heard the saying, said, Of a truth, this is the prophet. Others said, This is the Christ. But some said, Shall Christ come out of Galilee? You notice the division that's being caused. Everybody's got a different opinion about you. And see, the truth is, when it comes to someone who boldly preaches the truth, I, I, I say this, to, I used to say this when we were in Sacramento, where I'd invite people to church, and I'd tell them that when you come to this church, it's different than any churches you've been to. And people either love it or, or they hate it. There's really no in between. When Jesus was around, people either loved him or they hated him. There was really no in between. Because most people don't really state an opinion on anything. See, when it comes to preaching at a church, your job is to preach all of the Bible. Right. And there are parts of the Bible that are not fun to preach. You say, why are they not fun to preach? I've had times where I've preached sermons here at this church. And I'm worried that you know somebody is going to just not come back to church after I preach a sermon. Why? It might offend them. But you know what? It doesn't change the fact you still have to preach the whole Bible. Look, we're going chapter by chapter through the book of John. I can't skip a chapter because I'm worried about what the result's going to be. Because you never see Jesus saying, well, you know, I'm just worried. You know, I, I just called the Pharisees. I mean, he says, you're of your father the devil in John chapter 8. The next chapter we look at. He wasn't worried. You know, you just have to preach what the Bible says. Obviously, we do things in love. You don't do things and be a jerk. But, you know, you have to preach the whole Bible. Yeah. Now, in verse 42, the Bible says, Hath not the scripture said, This Christ cometh of the seed of David? And out of the town of Bethlehem, where David was. So there was a division among the people because of him. Verse 44. And some of them would have taken him, but no man laid hands on him. When it says they would have taken him, basically they want to throw him in prison, prison, beat him, kill him, whatever. They're trying to take him to arrest him. They're trying to stop him from preaching the truth. Verse 45. Then came the officers to the chief priests and Pharisees, and they said unto him, Why have you not brought him? The officers answered, never man spake like this man. That, that's like the coolest part of this chapter right here. Because basically these high-level people, the chief priests and the officers and the, the chief priests and the Pharisees, they send the officers basically to arrest him, and then the officers don't do it. And it's like, why didn't you do what we told you to do? It's like basically we pay your way. We're above you. We're more powerful. And they say, we've never heard anyone speak like this before. It's like, you go ahead and arrest him yourself. It's like, I'm not going to do it. Because they were afraid to arrest him. Because they were afraid what he's saying might be the truth. Mm -hmm. I'm sure some of them did believe on him. And so they said, well, I'm not going to do that. And honestly, when we preach today, you know, it's, it's kind of a similar reaction. Because obviously we're not Jesus Christ. But when you preach what the word of God says, it causes people to say, man, I, I haven't really heard preaching like this. Right. Why? Because very few churches actually preach like they did in the Bible. They're afraid to preach what the Bible says. And so honestly, when people come in here that visit, oftentimes what they say is, it's very different than what I've heard before. You know, I'm not really used to, to seeing so many Bible verses. I'm not used to, to hearing so much expounding on the scripture. Because most churches are really built out around entertainment and a rock concert and things like that. Yeah. That's never what we're going to be about. Yeah. It's always going to be about the word of God. Verse 47. Then answered them the Pharisees, Are ye also deceived? Have any of the rulers of the Pharisees believed on him? But this people who knoweth not the law are cursed. And so basically the Pharisees are basically saying, you know, you're, you, you know, none of us have believed on him. So if he was really the real deal, us that are powerful, us that are rulers, us that are Pharisees would have believed on him. Now, does that really make sense? No. When it comes to powerful people in today's world, do most of them believe on Jesus Christ? When it comes to all these politicians, do most of them love God? Do most of them believe on Jesus Christ? No, they don't. Now, they might say, well, you know, I love God. It's like, yeah, right. 
It's like, whatever, Mr. Politician. Look, you know, the fact that the Pharisees did not believe on him is good proof that he was the real dude. You know, the Pharisees didn't believe on him. They were high-level religious Jews, and look, they did not believe Jesus when he came. Look, the Jews said they were looking for Jesus, and honestly, most of them, when Jesus actually came, they didn't believe on him. Now, some did, and today, you know, if you were to preach to someone who was Jewish, some would believe on him. But look, the Bible says, he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. Right. And it doesn't matter whether you're Jew, Gentile, Hindu, Muslim, whether you grew up in church, whatever your background, if you don't believe on the Son, you will not see life. Yep. And they did not believe Jesus when he came. And these Pharisees, when they died, they went to hell. Yeah. Why? They didn't believe on Jesus Christ. Now, obviously, there's exceptions here and there. Nicodemus is an exception, which we're going to see here in verse 50. But by and large, most of them did not believe. And by and large, most powerful people and famous people and most powerful religious people do not believe on Jesus Christ. Most powerful religious people do not believe on Jesus Christ. Verse 50, Nicodemus saith unto them, he that came to Jesus by night, being one of them, doth our law judge any man before he hear him, and know what he doeth? They answered and said unto them, Art thou also of Galilee? Search and look, for out of Galilee ariseth no prophet, and every man went unto his own house. So I believe Nicodemus, who Jesus preached to in John chapter 3, did end up getting saved. But by and large, these Pharisees did not believe on Jesus Christ. And he basically calms down the situation. But what's the big theme you see here in this chapter? There's just a huge division. Mm -hmm. About Jesus Christ. I mean, there's there's a million different opinions being thrown out there. And it would be the exact same thing today. If Jesus was around today, then people would be very divided. Some people would believe on him, and then others would say he's a deceiver, others would say this, others would say that. That's the way it is. And you know, we have everyone has this idea that you know what, if Jesus was around today, you know, I'd love him, I'd worship him. And it's like, well, that's not what happened 2,000 years ago. Yep. I don't really see why it would be any different today. Because if you didn't really believe on the people that, that preached the word of God back then, you wouldn't believe on it now. And vice versa. The people that are saved today, guess what? 2,000 years ago, you would have gotten saved. Why? Because some people choose to believe what the Bible says, and some don't. Let's close the word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for allowing us to be here today and just getting to uh, read through John chapter 7. And, uh, you know, asking God to help us apply this over to our lives, help us do everything we can to continue to study your word and to learn your word and, and realize that, you know, when you were here, it did cause quite a division. And us today, even if we try to live godly and be as kind as we possibly can, God, it will cause division at times. And not everybody will like the message that you have, but it doesn't change the fact.